The Unshackled Waves, episode 189. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. The Wentworth by-election campaign is finally underway with the two main candidates emerging being the Liberal pre-selected candidate Dave Sharma and high-profile independent Dr Karen Phelps. The Liberals' lack of female MPs and allegations of bullying of current female Liberal MPs is again in the news with Anne Submalis now joining Julia Banks by saying she won't contest the next election due to bullying. A Royal Commission has been called into aged care in Australia in response to a Four Corners expose and repeated revelations of elder abuse and the battle for the nationalist voters heated up this week with Fraser Anning saying safe schools is designed by people who would have been strung up in his day and Pauline Hanson moving a motion in the Senate saying it's okay to be white. To discuss it all, I am joined back this week by the Unshackled's political editor, Michael Smythe. Michael, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Tim. Uh, now, are you able to please explain your absence last week? Yes, apologies to our subscribers and followers. There were some unresolved computer issues that caused my absence and was not able to allow me to uh, do a proper uh, segment for the week. I hope you enjoyed Damien Ferry, our senior editor, however. Our viewers and listeners will actually notice tonight that there's less noise uh, coming for, from your end. <laughs> Yes, I um the part of the um issues that I had um with technology were the fact that the laptop I was using was overheating and thus causing a massive racket on the microphone. However, this old laptop, ironically, actually works a lot better in terms of not having as much um sound for coming from the cooling fans. <laughs> I, I'd encourage you to use it for, for future shows, but uh, on with more uh, serious matters now, and uh, the Wentworth by-election campaign is finally underway, while the, the Liberals uh, pre-selected their candidate, uh, Dave Sharma, who was Australia's former ambassador to Israel. He won out of uh, a field of eight candidates. They had six rounds of voting. Uh, this was last uh, Thursday evening. The, the by-election is held on Saturday, October the 20th. Now, uh, Malcolm Turnbull and John Howard, they backed uh, Dave Sharma and he beat the female candidates. It was reported that Scott Morrison had wanted a female, but he said that that was uh, fake news. And the other uh, high-profile candidates, Christine Forster, Tony Abbott's sister, she dropped out early. Uh, Andrew Bragg, uh, who former uh, interim director of the, the, the Liberal Party and now with the Business Council, he pulled out uh, saying that he wanted to make way for a woman, but uh, it didn't work out that way. Mm -hmm. Well, at the end of the day, you've got to remember that the pre-selectors don't care if you're a man or a woman. It depends on how popular you legitimately are and whether they think that you will do the best job. So that's what it comes down to. We don't have quite, well, they, I'm not in the Liberal Party anymore, I haven't been for four years, but the Liberal Party does not have quotas as such, despite, despite people in the Liberal Party saying, oh, we should have quotas. No, they shouldn't have quotas. They never should. And God willing, they never will. Uh, Sharma won because he had the most support, not because he was a man and not a woman, not because he was handpicked by Turnbull and blessed by Howard, but because he had the majority of uh, pre-selectors behind him at the end of the day. That's what it came down to. It should also be noted, speaking of our, um, well, the, the choices for the people of Wentworth, rather, not ours, uh, that Peter King, the man that Malcolm Turnbull ruled in 2004, actually contested as a member of the Liberal Party for the pre-selection, he was knocked out in the, I believe it was the fourth or fifth round. I haven't got the figures on me right now, but his vote actually increased steadily and then it dropped off before he was eliminated. 
Yeah, that was interesting. Oh, because he initially got uh, banned from the Liberal Party for, I think it was five or ten years for running as an independent, but uh, it's been a long time uh, since uh, he uh, lost his, his pre-selection, so why not have a, have a crack to uh, stick it up Malcolm? Mm, it would have been beautiful if if Peter King had won the pre-selection, he would actually have won it for the he would actually win it for the Liberal Party. Now with Sharma, don't get me wrong, I I don't know Sharma personally, but what I've read on Sharma and what I've heard about Sharma is that he's decent, he's actually quite competent. But given that he is seeing rightly or wrongly as Turnbull's man, I don't think he's going to be able to hold on as convincingly as Turnbull did, or indeed King did before he got rolled in the pre-selection of 2004. Well, who knows if uh, Malcolm Turnbull is even going to campaign for him because he's on a sabbatical in, in New York City. And let's remember that his uh, son, Alex Turnbull, uh, advocated for people to support the, the Labour campaign. Mm, mm. No, I don't think... Um... I don't think Dave Sharma can count on any support from Turnbull, apart from saying, oh, no, I'll back you, I'll back you in the pre-selection. Apart from that, Turnbull's not going to do anything for him. Yeah, and I doubt we'll see uh, Malcolm on a, on a polling booth on uh, October 20. Now, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, he held this seat uh, by a margin of 17.7%. Uh, uh, so on paper, it looks a very safe liberal seat. But what you have to remember is that Wentworth, it takes, it's one of the wealthiest uh, electorates uh, in, in, in the country. But that also means that, yes, there's, there's a lot of traditional wealthy uh, liberal voters, but there's also been a lot of inner city trendies move into the, the area. And that's why um, Malcolm, Malcolm Turnbull was, had such a strong vote there because he was from the left of the, the Liberal Party, supported things like uh, action on climate change and, and same-sex same marriage. And so Labor, uh, they, they think that they can cause some mischief now that the, 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 the great uh, progressive Malcolm Turnbull is gone. Uh, Labor's <laughs> candidate is uh, Tim Murray. He was already pre-selected to contest Wentworth for the next uh, federal uh, election and, and Labor has decided to uh, contest the, the, uh, the by-election and yeah even if despite uh, what uh, a lot of us think of Malcolm Turnbull he managed to make Wentworth a, a very safe seat for the Liberals and it's it's going to be difficult especially since uh, a lot of those types of people who liked Malcolm are going to be bitterly uh, upset that he was dumped as Prime Minister and now they're being forced into this by-election. Well, what goes around comes around. Cry me a river, Tim. I mean, honestly. I mean, he rolled Peter King in 2004 and he didn't get rolled in this pre-selection. He wouldn't have been rolled at his pre-selection had he, you know, been a man and stayed in Parliament. But then again, it's probably a good thing that he left because he would have just kept on sniping and sniping just like he did from 2009 to 2015 against the leader. So, you know, good riddance to bad rubbish, to be honest. Um, look, in regards to the demographics, yes, it's true they have changed. But at the end of the day, I don't think that enough of them are going to be thinking with their naive, hipsterish idealism to change the positioning of the electorate at least they won't go to labor there is a possibility however that people may vote for dr karen phelps instead as a protest um, she's running as an independent she's the former president of the ama the australian medical association there is a possibility they might vote for her out of spite but you can probably expect quite a few of them to actually still preference Liberal second, even though there's actually a Labor consultant helping Dr. Phelps yes. in her campaign. Uh, Darren <laughs> Barnett, uh, he helped uh, in the, the Super Saturday uh, by-elections as a consultant. And uh, Karen Phelps has said, oh, my independence uh, isn't uh, co compromised by this. And it's, it, it's 
become pretty obvious that uh, Labor, uh, they're realising they're not going to win this seat. Uh, their next best option is to try and knock the Liberals off with a uh, popular independent. Let's remember that the Labor Party ran uh, in the Mayo by-election simply so they could give preferences to Rebecca Sharkey to beat the Liberals' uh, Georgina Downer. So it's... Oh, well, uh, Labor, you've got to admire their commitment to run in a seat that they're going to lose just to cause cause trouble for the Liberal Party. Ah, oh, well, that's the Labor Party for you. That's what the Liberal Party do. The Liberal Party will run in a safe Labor seat just to spite Labor. The Labor Party will run in a safe Liberal seat just to spite the Liberals. It's how the major parties do their vote bank politics. Uh, now, Karen Phelps, uh, she uh, is a City of Sydney councillor. She was uh, Deputy Lord Mayor until she had a falling out with uh, the, the dear uh, Lord Mayor Clover Moore. Uh, <laughs> I, can't, I can't imagine how, how, how that could have happened. No, no, perish the thought. <laughs> I think I would have preferred Dr Phelps as Lord Mayor, just between you and me. <laughs> yeah, I am. She's... Uh, She's also was quite prominent in the the yes uh, campaign for for same sex marriage. Uh, some libertarians are not happy with her candidacy, given that uh, uh, as AMA president, she supported a lot of nanny state me measures such as uh, health warnings. Uh, she, she she's trying to be the. Uh, everything for everybody candidate saying that if i'm elected because if she wins then the uh the government loses its one seat majority that uh i i can i, I can work with the government to achieve outcomes i'm the uh, i've i am the the person who's going to be happy to negotiate and help improve legislation. I mean, she talked about uh, ha how she was able to modify the the e health records when that when that was uh, uh, st starting to get a lot of uh, attention. Which, yeah, you can see why a lot of people in Wentworth would be attracted to that, saying, "Well, even though we're going to uh, the, the the government's going to be in minority, at least we'll have this nice independent who said she's going to work constructively." whether that pans out in reality who knows mm -hmm. look dr phelps is a relatively astute woman so i wouldn't want to put money down on the wentworth result my gut feeling suggests there's probably going to be either sharma or phelps winning the seat now the fact that phelps has come out and said that she will work with the government means that she won't or she's less likely I should say, to be tempted by a motion of no confidence brought in the House of Representatives by opportunistic, I mean, opposition leader Bill Shorten. So, plus we've only got, it's September now. The general election probably won't be for another six months anyway. So, bearing that in mind, I don't think we're going to, at least I hope, we're not going to have an earlier election um, anytime soon. I don't think we're going to have an election before March. The story that keeps uh, rolling forward is that of uh, liberal female MPs uh, being bullied. Now, uh, Julia Banks, the, the member for Chisholm, a marginal Victorian seat, she'd already announced that she was leaving at the next election. She gave a speech in Parliament last week calling for quotas for in the Liberal Party for female MPs, saying they work everywhere else. Uh, we have them for... Uh, in the the cabinet and the ministry for uh state and uh factional and uh other uh reasons so why can't they work uh, for uh pre-selections and then we also had Anne Sidmalis uh announcing she would not contest her marginal New South Wales seat of uh, Gilmore uh, but we actually in her speech uh to, to parliament she actually named a a bully which we which we hadn't heard as yet. Uh, Gareth Ward, a state MP, uh, accused him of uh, branch stacking and trying to uh, undermine her because there'd been a lot of cloud over her her pre-selection. And now there's a push for a complaint process uh, in the Liberal Party. Scott Morrison has tried to play down this as much as possible, but it's just been the the gift for Labour, who's who 
pretty much achieve 50-50 male-female representation saying, ha ha, look at how uh, ge uh, gender diverse we are. Uh, 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 look at you, you bully women out of parliament. I think Emma Hughes uh, would like a word with you, Mr. Shorten. <laughs> sorry, I shouldn't be so facetious. So fit. <clears throat> Pardon me, sorry, I shouldn't be so facetious about this. Look, um, we know that Julia Banks and, and St. Marlis were Turnbull lights. They were backers of Turnbull. Um, Julia Banks has been under a cloud for a while and she's been complaining about uh, pressures of her job. It's like, well, it's politics. If you can't handle the pressure, don't do it. It's that simple. Um, as for Anson Marlis um, calling out Gareth Ward, oh, is, he, is he an MLA or an MLC? MLA. He's an MLA. Okay. Well, the fact that she's saying that, oh, he's been branch stacked. He's like, well, funny that, you know, if you're accusing someone else of branch stacking when you've already got your pre-selection secured the last time, that sounds a little bit like projection to me. I mean, maybe she's, maybe she's telling the truth and maybe Gareth Ward is trying to stack it out against her, but it sounds like something a, another branch stack would say, as yes, the old adage goes, it takes one to know one. Well, their pre-selection in the end was uh, secured by Malcolm Turnbull and, and Scott Morrison. Uh, Prime Ministers can uh, intervene to uh, sa uh, save uh, lo local federal MPs uh, if needed. Mm, and Grandfathering or a captain's call, yeah. Yeah, but she decided, no, nah, I've had enough and, and want to leave. And yeah, there's been a lot of talk about... Uh, because yeah, polit politics is a is a tough game. There's uh, people who won't mince their words in, in politics, and uh, f you know, is uh, the the debate has been: is there actual cases of of bullying, or is it just that uh, these uh, women they just they they just can't cut it? And one thing I want to bring up about Anne Malice, I mean, she she comes across to me as a bit of a snowflake because I recall an incident in Parliament last year. She made a statement calling the, the penalty rate uh, cut that the Fair Work uh, Commission uh, brought down. She said it was a gift for young people. And so Labor uh, attacked her in question time over this quote. And she cried in the chamber. She had to get a tissue to wipe away her tears. And I was just like, how pathetic. You're a federal MP in the... Uh, basically, in in the uh, the the lion's den where uh, you know there there's warfare going on all the time, and you 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 have have a cry. I mean, that is weak. Mm. Oh, it is weak. It is weak. I'd actually forgotten about that one. I'd actually forgotten about that incident. She's not the only one who. She's not the only MP in the House of Representatives who has had the has been brought to tears by opposition attacks. But the interesting thing about these allegations of bullying, it seems to be the... I don't want to sound like I'm trivialising it. I would never trivialise bullying, bullying. But it seems to me that a lot of people are actually just... Um, coming out with this because it's it's in vogue at the moment say oh I'm, I'm suffering from bullying well there are two choices in regards to bullying let's assume that they're telling the truth let's give them the benefit of the doubt there are two things you either suffer it or you endure it most politicians will endure it even when it is happening simply because of the fact that politics is very much a monk's game it's a very very severe unforgiving and relentless occupation to be involved in. It's not for everyone. And it looks good. Maybe it looks good because you've watched episodes of The West Wing or even Yes Minister and thought, yeah, I could become a I could become a politician, just let the public service do everything for me. No, 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 no. It's not that glamorous. Not at all. And the thing is, if they're getting to the stage where they are crying because some asshole on the opposition benches decides to have a go, 
take a bex, have a lie down, give your seat to someone who is more able to handle the criticism or, even better, someone who will take that criticism and throw it back in the Labour Party's face. And there was a, everyone thought, a coded uh, message because it's it's not just these no-name backbench female MPs, Julia Banks and Ed Zimalas. There's also uh, Julie Bishop, uh, former foreign minister and deputy leader. She, uh, she, she, she said that, oh, this bullying, it could actually be illegal, which is a bit of a stretch. I didn't know that incidents of, of uh, bullying in, in politics would be illegal. And, uh, this complaint process for the Liberal Party, this is being pushed by uh, the the Minister for Women, Kelly O'Dwyer, and they all wore uh, red in Parliament, which was interpreted by the media as some cryptic message, that, as some showing of female solidarity. And it seems to, to me that these women are using this opportunity, or, or I'd say trying to salvage something from the leadership still saying hey we'll we'll never have a better time to put our case for uh, more uh, more women uh, in the in the liberal party being being pre-selected than now let's milk it for all it's worth and uh, basically bully uh, to get quotas <laughs> yeah it's funny that i with all respect to julie bishop i think she's wrong here um if you're talking about bats within the parliamentary chamber it's covered under parliamentary privilege, so no, uh, would not be considered as illegal, as, at least on the case of Anson Marlis being torn a new one by someone in the Labor Party. Um, outside of Parliament, if there is a, if you could prove systemic and sustained harassment, maybe, but I don't think, I don't think, um, I don't believe it would be considered as actionable within the parliamentary chambers. I mean, parliamentary privilege exists. Well, would reason. liberal a liberal female MPs then go to the Fair Work Commission? Like, that, that, that'd be a bizarre look. That, and it just couldn't happen because the Fair Work Commission would look at it and say, um, yes, you're being bullied, but you're... Well, they might say, yeah, you're being bullied, but this is happening during Parliament, covered by parliamentary privilege. We can't do anything, we're sorry. At least that's how I would expect it to go down. Plus, if it did, if, they, if anyone ever did, it would look extremely embarrassing. Although it's fortunate for Emma Hussar that none of her staff has ever took her to the Fair Work Commission. Otherwise, she would have been, well, she would have been bankrupted, most likely, for her reprehensible behaviour and abuse of her staffers. And it's also been pointed out by commentators such as Andrew Bolt that all of these women, they come from the left of the Liberal Party. There's been no conservative uh, female Liberal MPs who've joined them, such as uh, Amanda Stoker and Confetta uh, uh, Ferravanti uh, Wells. And you, you would hardly think that there's, <laughs> there, there, there's different treatment for, for different women, even there's discrimination against female Liberal MPs or, there, or there's not. Why is there... They're one group saying yes, the other saying no. Because Amanda and Conchetta aren't a bunch of wuss, aren't a couple of wusses. That's why they've actually got That's spine. bullying language. Yeah. Oh, boo hoo hoo hoo. Sorry, can I get a tissue from them? Can I get a tissue? Come on. Look, <laughs> look, seriously though. Um, no, I know Amanda. She, um, she and her husband are old friends of mine and Amanda is a very solid representative and senator for Queensland, and she would not cry wolf over something as negligible or as pathetic as what Banks and Submalis have been doing, put it that way. Um, Conchetta Firavanti Wells is the same. She's a strong woman, and she's not going to complain about a storm in a teacup, put it that way. The interesting thing that I've noted here, and I noted it in the Australian yesterday, um, one of the vice presidents of the Liberal Party, uh, Tina McQueen, she made the comment that, and it was a rather scathing comment, actually, was, and it reads here as, what did she write? What did she say? Oh, uh, yeah, if, I've got it here. When, yeah. Women always want the spoils of victory without the fight, unquote. Even if that isn't taken out of context, 
it is rather damning as an it's a rather damning indictment of the people who um who are saying let's have quotas in parliament when you've got tina mcquinn saying let's not have quotas in parliament let's get everyone into their positions through merit not through quotas we're not the labor party yet so you know let's just keep things the way as the way that they are you know i mean it should be noted that tina mcqueen didn't become vice president of the liberal one of the vice presidents of the liberal party by being part of a quota did she she won it because she was able to win over the um i forget the, I forget the technical name for it now the the body that elects the executive of Liberal the Federal, Federal Council. Liberal Party. Yeah, the, she was she was able to convince the majority of the Liberal Council that she would be a suitable vice president. She didn't need a quota for that. Maybe that's why she's being so scathing about it. But you know what, Tim? She's right. We have a another royal commission that's been uh, called into the the aged care sector now we've seen uh, on the news uh, over the past few months some horrific uh, incidents of elder abuse where uh, uh, relatives of loved ones in nursing homes are put in hidden cameras and seen nursing home staff physically attack uh, uh, pe people in uh, nursing homes and they've been prosecuted uh, for it and there was also the the high profile Oakton nursing home in in South Australia that uh, shut down uh, after an ABC investigation in 2017 and now the uh, well, we're in the, the middle of uh, ABC's Four Corners program. They're airing a two-part uh, investigation into Australia's aged care uh, sector. Now, even before the, the first part went to air this Monday night, uh, Scott Morrison, uh, the Federal Health Minister Greg Hunt, and the aged care minister Ken Wyatt announced a, a Royal Commission basically preempting the, the the program which is and we've seen we saw, we saw a royal commission called into uh, uh into youth detention in the northern territory i think about 10 hours after uh a four corners program uh, went to air this has been called before the four corners uh <laughs> Uh, episode has has gone to air and so they're, they're really getting ahead of uh four corners here and it used to be an old joke that uh four corners every episode is somebody saying i want a royal commission into something mm. well i wish i could say that was a joke but it's not always a joke when people say that um no, in fairness, I haven't actually had the chance to, because I've had a very busy week um, analyzing a lot of things, and I haven't actually had a chance to watch the first part yeah, yet. I, I've watched but... it, so I can I can go through it. So it it showed examples of uh, neglect of uh, people in nursing homes. So su things such as they they want to get out of bed, they're left in bed for like an hour, two hours. And, and they're not stand over, so they yeah. get bed sores, all yeah. things like that. Yeah, mm. they're, they're stuff where oh, like, air conditioning is not working properly and not fixed, uh, radio TVs are broken and, and not fixed. And so basically, they're, they're, the elderly, they're, they're e it's either they're you know bored out of their brain. It's a, like, can you imagine just sitting in a chair all day with with nothing nothing to do when also you know being stuck in bed with uh, what's soiled clothes it, it wouldn't be uh, ple pleasant at all so yeah it it wasn't as shocking as i thought it would be given what we had seen on the news with these assaults it was more just the the little things there was also pro probably i'd say probably the most um disturbing aspect was over the medication of dementia patients there was one lady who she, she basically went through like a full mental breakdown because she'd been uh, over medicated one one th the the main takeaway I got out of it is that it like all of this could have been avoided if the the families had uh, been willing to make the sacrifices to look after their loved ones in home. Um, but of course, that doesn't excuse the, the their mistreatment in these aged care centres. I mean, they pay good money to or hundreds of thousands of dollars to have a, a room in the in these places. You'd expect uh, better.
Mm-hmm. Exactly. And I think you've hit the nail right on the head there, Tim. The Oakton Nursing Home, was that the one run by the AVO company? Um, it was, it was by the, I think it was, I can't remember who it was run by, but, uh, the, the South Australian aged care minister, she, uh, resigned not just from her position, but from parliament at the 2018 state election. So, uh, uh, the, the buck stopped with, uh, the state government in that case. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It's like I said, you've hit the nail right on the head there. Um, the family should be taking care of their their elderly loved ones where possible but that doesn't excuse the abhorrent neg- neglect and negligence on the part of some of the staff um, in some of these facilities that being said however and and i have a friend of mine who actually works in aged care he's a very good friend of mine he works in aged he works in aged care and in nursing and he's pointed out that there is a lot of demand placed on the aged care staff and they yes. don't get paid nearly enough to take care of to take care of their clients or to take care of patients if they're actually trained as um, doctors or counselors they don't get paid nearly enough i mean they get paid what minimum wage if they're lucky yeah that's I what mean... they get You'd, you'd, be, you'd, you'd probably earn the, the same being a shop assistant uh, uh, working in a, a aged care uh, facility. And yeah, they've also like the, the training is like to get to, to become an aged care worker, like the, the training is, is pretty basic. It's only six to 12 weeks for looking after the most vulnerable people uh, in society who have... Uh, a lot of well, the reason that they're there in those aged care facilities because they have chronic uh, health uh, c- uh, conditions mm, that uh, that their families probably can't take care of even if they wanted to and the, <coughs> excuse me sorry um and the thing is as well i mean it's not just the fact that they only paid a pittance for what they do an absolute pittance which disgusts me not from a not because I'm a socialist, because I'm definitely not a socialist, but it disgusts me because the fact is these people are expected to be the carers, effective counsellors, comforters, spiritual advisors even in some cases. You know, you've got people who require, say they don't want to go to church or mosque or temple or synagogue. You know, the the one of the nurses will drive them to... Um, their church or religious building of choice. Then you'll have sometimes they'll just want to talk and they'll just break down and tell you how much pain they've been suffering since they lost their spouse, since they lost their pet, since they lost whomever or whatever. And it just goes on and on. The, the aged care workers have a really really difficult time they do a lot more than they get paid for they actually deserve a lot more money than what they get paid currently and in a way and it's still wrong if staff are physically abusing their clients that's absolutely abhorrent but you can understand why sometimes they might snap why people might snap because there's not there are not enough aged care staff to take care of no. all of our all the people who require aged yeah. care they, they calculated that aged care workers uh, in the morning have roughly six minutes per resident to basically get them showered, get them dressed for the day, and that we couldn't get ourselves clean and dressed in six minutes. Mm. Not even in four minutes <laughs> when they have the level six water restrictions in Queensland. <laughs> but seriously, sorry, I shouldn't laugh about that. But anyway, my point is... Six minutes is not enough. Even if you double that to 12 minutes, it, to have a proper shower, you probably need eight or ten, eight to 10 minutes at least. Mm. I don't know how long you take on a shower. I like to take 10 minutes because I like to be clean. Um, in terms of what brushing your teeth, it takes what, three or four minutes to brush your teeth if you're doing it properly. Guy, do and not to mention all the other ablutions, which I won't go into, you get the idea. It's going to take a lot more than six minutes. 
it's it's weird that they're, they're playing top dollar uh, for these uh, rooms at nursing homes, yet the the staff are being paid um, a, a pittance, as we're, as we're just discussed. And there, there, there's also massive government subsidies. So where's all this all this money going to? Because if we agree that aged care workers need to be paid more, then the expense is going to go up even even further. I mean, it just because you know i come from an economic uh, uh point of view that uh, if you if you want to pay workers more then you the, the 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 costs have to have to increase as well i mean would uh would the the consumers uh cop that or i i think they'd do anything to avoid the situations we saw on on four corners but what is the uh solution <sighs> You're going to hate this, Tim, because I am going to come up with a somewhat authoritarian slash regulatory answer. My answer is basically this. The amount of money that's poured into the aged care sector by government and by private benefactors and by subsidies from state governments in some cases should be enough to put up all of the clients of aged care facilities in the equivalent of a four-star or five-star hotel. But the fact is, they're not getting that. Where is all the money going? And I hope that this Royal Commission does find that out. But my suspicion is a lot of it is disappearing on overheads. It's not that they're embezzling the money. They're not embezzling the money. And even if I thought that, I would never say that. It's the overheads because you're paying consultants, you're paying marketing staff, uh. you're, paying, you're paying HR staff, human resources staff, um, you're paying cleaning staff. Yeah, in addition to the in addition to the nurses, um, and then you're in some cases also going through um, recruitment agencies, which also ties into human resources. So you've got five areas already where money is being spent before it trickles down to the aged care workers. So what I would suggest, if, if I were the per if I were the aged care minister and the findings of the Royal Commission pointed out that a lot of money is being wasted on inefficiencies and overheads, I'd be saying, okay, cut these overheads or cut your profits. Otherwise, we will pull the funding from you and we will start up our own um our own aged care system so the libertarian in me still thinks that the minute you introduce uh, government money uh, into it and the same has happened with the the university sector uh, sector as well because these the, the, these aged care companies become reliant on their uh, uh, the, the government money. Will they will they know that they're going to get it no matter what? And if they mess up, they're going to get more money because in the uh, the Four Corners program, if uh, if residents looked more sick, then they get more funding. So there was an incentive to say, look at how fra uh, frail they are. So if you depend on this this government money, then you're going to have warped uh, priorities. It's not. Like if you if you ran a hotel which was just putrid, I mean you'd get you'd go out of business. Uh, yeah, I um I don't want to comment on that because if I comment on that, it's probably not going to be very um <laughs> it's probably not going to be very polite. But you're right about the whole government money thing. You know, people getting used to living off the government's teeth. That is one thing I will agree with you on definitely. There has been a case. Um, in other in another industry, not aged care necessarily, although it wouldn't surprise me given what you've just said. But in the how do I refer to it? the unemployment industry, I guess you could say, in terms of employing people, you know, you have all these job. You used to have all these job agencies. They would get incentives to put someone in work who had been out of work for more than. A, for longer than a certain period of time and where it was either four months or six months. So for example, if you were unemployed for four months or six months and then you got a job, then they would get a bonus from the government saying, oh, you've placed someone who's long-term unemployed into a job. Oh, good job. Here, here's, here, have some money. But um, I think that it could be similar with the aged care based on what you were saying and i hope to god i'm wrong 
but if people are looking at it from the sense of, oh look we need more money because our clients are so sick and so worn notwithstanding the insensitive part of me that wants to say that's just old age the compassionate part of me says you're you're if this is true you are cynically allowing people to suffer to manipulate the charity and compassion of others and that is absolutely disgusting and if you're doing that you should be ashamed of yourself now i mentioned at the beginning that whenever there's uh, these investigation or royal commissions called it seems to be that that's the uh, the government's best immediate uh, solution, and it's worth uh, discussing the the merits of, of royal commissions. The the reason that they're they're called is because of the basically the failure of the the regulators. I mean, let's have a look at the banking uh, royal commission. I mean, that is uh, uh, exposing the failure of the corporate regulator uh, ASIC, and has also had the benefit of just. Uh, highlighting how these banks and uh, the the products that they offer insurances just how uh, morally uh, bankrupt they've been in charging dead people uh, selling uh, selling insurance to disabled people and I also should point out that the second part of this four corners investigation is into the failure of uh, the government agencies to pick up uh, these things. So, yeah, a Royal Commission, it takes one or two years to investigate, but it's really the only way to get the dirty laundry out and have the, the ordinary person on the on the street say, wow, I did not know that this was so rotten. Mm -hmm. when, think, when Royal Commissions are called, things are pretty bad in the, in the area of occupation or the industry. It's it, it's necessary to have a royal commission. Um, in the case of the banks, I think the length was a little bit too short, is a little too short. In the aged care industry, I hope it's not too short. We've seen a bit of a chase for the nationalist vote in Australia uh, heat up a bit. Now, uh, a bit. obviously, yeah, the, this has occurred since uh, Fraser Anning made his uh, maiden speech uh, to the uh, the Senate where he called for a, a plebiscite on uh, immigration to Australia, which he uh, said would be a final solution, which uh, triggered everyone into uh, oblivion. Uh, and it also... Uh, not a fan of the speech was uh, Pauline Hansen, who said it was appalling uh, straight out of uh, Goebbels' uh, handbook, and she copped a lot of backlash for her supporters for basically uh, cucking out and and Fraser Anning was well, he he was well, elevated to oh uh, a lot of nationalists were saying is 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 he the guy that will uh, f uh that that should be the our voice in in parliament and is uh, speaking our language now this week in in parliament we saw uh, uh, yeah I'd say the heat turned up uh, on both sides uh, Fraser Anning he he called the uh, the safe schools program uh, degenerate uh, designed by sexual deviants who would be uh, strung up uh, uh, f 50 years ago and then we had uh, Pauline Hansen uh, put up a motion in the Senate that uh, uh, f uh, calling out uh, racism against white people and saying that it's okay to be white, which is a popular phrase among uh, nationalists. Mm, mm, mm. Yes, well, I already made my comments in regards to Pauline's blatant hypocrisy regarding her condemnation of Anning's speech. So there's no need for me to reprise that. If you are interested in watching my, what I might politely call a brain snap, uh, I'll go back to episode 184 or 185, I believe it was. Anyway, um, look, the speech that Senator Anning made about, you know, what was the phrase he used? Como perverts, I think was the phrase. Yeah, yeah. I'm paraphrasing. There was, yeah. Uh, I've got the Twitter feed. I can, I can bring it up here uh, if I just bring it up. Yeah, a communist pervert. <laughs> yes. And a lot of people will ask, because there are a lot of people who are opposed to the Safe Schools program simply because it's just disgusting. It's just wrong. 
Yeah. And, and a lot of these people even include advocates of same-sex marriage as well. There are a lot of people who support same-sex marriage who hate, absolutely detest the safe school program because it's just disgusting. It really is. And Senator Anning is right to say that, you know, if they tried pushing this filth in the 1950s, well, they'd be in trouble. Maybe not strung up, but they would certainly be facing sedition charges, put yeah. it that way. I'd encourage uh, our uh, followers to check out Fraser Anning's uh, Twitter feed. Yes. He understands. Okay, but in fairness, he understands as well the popularity that he's received. It's not going to last forever if he just makes one supposedly incendiary speech and then goes back to saying nothing. So mm. he's going to maintain the rage to demonstrate that he's a much better uh, poster child no, not past child, poster man for the nationalists and patriots than, you know, yesterday's hero Pauline Hansen, who is nothing more than a false prophet and a sellout. You mentioned the one up game that's going on, or I'm calling it a one up game. I would actually refer to it less politely as a pissing contest, but the fact is, Anning's winning that hands down as well. Yes, Pauline, yesterday, I think it was, actually gave notice to move a couple of motions saying that you know it's one it's okay to be white and what was the other part i should remember the other Call, part. Uh, calling out anti-white racism the rise I'm of anti-white anti -white racism. racism yeah which is it's very big of her to be calling that out considering how racist she was in 1996 <laughs> Oh, no, she claims she never called for the white Australia policy and that she's always uh, been an advocate for uh, equality. Yeah, that's how she's marketing herself now to try and appeal to the centrist vote, the normie vote, the boomer vote, and the disaffected and disenfranchised Liberal Party vote. But unlike Fraser Anning, she has forgotten one demographic that she needs to appeal to, which... Anning, especially after his joining with Bob Catter, has managed quite well. The disaffected, disenfranchised old Labour vote. The real left, not this lily pad neo-Marxist prattle that passes as the left these days, but the actual old left workers' rights, workers' welfare, workers' prosperity. Yeah, and... and, and take care of the people. Yeah, and Pauline's smart. I mean, she uh, checks uh, her social media quite regularly. She would have no noticed that she reacted wrongly to Fraser Anning's maiden speech and probably reacted more out of spite because he used to be, well, he was elected as a One Nation senator leaving on his first day uh, in the in the Senate. And now she's, she's realized, oh, crap, all, all my followers are now flocking to him because, as I just pointed out, he's unapologetic. He, he's doubling down on, on his views, of basically energizing the nationalist basis like, Finally, he just doesn't care. He's just saying what he believes. He does, and of course, most importantly, he's uh, tri uh, he's triggering the the lefties to to new levels. Like I love how they <laughs> they they think that oh oh, there's this racist race to the to the bottom to see who can uh, appeal to you know the the worst in our society. And there's all this you know butt hurt on on Twitter from uh, BuzzFeed and all all, all these other all. all <laughs> these other uh, publications okay michael remember your filter has to be on for this podcast um <laughs> i could ca i couldn't care less what those left hards those morons those snowflakes and the other so-called alt media outlets such as buzzfeed and junkie think i couldn't care less what they think they're a bunch of petulant morons and they should be sent back to school to actually learn the difference between objectivity and subjectivity. Anyway, I digress. My point is as succinctly put as I can, and it's still going to take a while because I have a lot to say and I need to think of a way to compress it into the next two minutes or less. Pauline Hansen used to adv advocate an agenda that was much more in line with what Australians thought and felt privately back in 1996 than she does now. 
she steals policies that she thinks might give her an edge in terms of winning the vote. I mean, the ALA, the ALA's policy on putting a moratorium on Islamic immigration, she basically stole that and then she started beating up on Muslims in the press and all these people who are anti, uh, anti-Islam, anti not anti-Muslim, no, to, to be fair, but anti-Islam voted for her because she was established, she was known, even though there was only 5 or 10% of the ALS policy, but I digress. My point is she stopped caring about what the people thought genuinely caring about what the people thought the moment she was re-elected to the Senate. Now she's just intent on keeping herself in there. So she'll troll through her social media to elicit reactions accordingly. And she'll ask, hey, so what do you guys think? And then after her criticism of her former friend, because this is the thing, Fraser Anning and Pauline Hanson used to be really good friends for more than 20 years. He was originally going to be number two on the Senate ticket. But he declined because he was, if I recall correctly, it's because he was going over to America. Anyway, I'll have to ask him about that when I see him on Tuesday. But the thing is, um, he was originally going to be the number two Senate candidate before he turned it down and she found Malcolm Roberts. Malcolm Roberts then gets kicked out for being a dual citizen. More on that later. He then, uh, Fraser then becomes the new senator. She says to him, you've got to do everything I tell you. I want you to resign so that Malcolm can come back. And he said no. And then she said, well, fire certain staff of yours. And he said again, no, I'm not going to let you push me around. We're friends, but I'm not going to let you tell me what to do. So ever since then, there's been this massive grudge match. Uh, massive, massive, massive grudge match. Massive grudge being played out between the two of them because there's a lot of bad blood there. So Pauline is now acting not just out of spite, but also out of the realization, oh crap, I might not get reelected in 2022 if I'm running against Fraser. So I need to find a way to smother him rather than attacking him. And as such, She's doing all these things to pander to um, the more hardline nationalists, I guess you could say. I guess you'd call them saying, you know, it's okay to be white and we should condemn yeah. anti-white racism. We should definitely condemn anti-white racism because we should yeah. condemn racism, period. I mean, but, yeah, don't get me wrong. It's a, it's a good development, this uh, battle, because it's it's finally that the, the, even though... Uh, Anning and Hanson uh, are in, in minor parties, that there's politicians who uh, are willing to vie for the, the nationalist vote. I mean, like, just look at how they're, they're marginalized by uh, mainstream media and uh, the, the, the politicians in the, in, the, in the major parties. I mean, they, mm. they, wa uh, they, they won't be seen anywhere near a, a nationalist figure. And that's not to mention the whole thing with um, Anastasia Palaszczuk, um, punishing the Cata Party members in Queensland's parliament because they refused to condemn what a federal representative of their party said, the federal senator of their party said. So they're going to punish the people of, not just the members of the um, the parliamentary party of Cata, but also the, um, the electorates of said Cata Party members just to make a point. Now that you could argue is actually intimidation. You could actually make that argument and no doubt we'll be hearing a lot more about that in the future. But this also makes him martyr in a sense. He's, a vi he's been made a victim. He's been victimized by the big parties now, which actually earns him brownie points. Similar to the way Pauline Hansen earned brownie points or martyr points in her case for, um, being jailed for electoral irregularities in the early 2000s. Yes, you're too right with that. Uh, well, we'll see where this uh, battle uh, goes. Uh, Parliament is uh, off uh, uh, a few weeks uh, now, but I'm sure there'll still be plenty of, of happenings in, in the next week. So we'll, we'll discuss it then, Michael, and it was good to have you back. Thank you, Tim.
All right, everybody, that's the show for today. The Unshackled is one of the final six nominees in the Free Speech Coalition's Independent Media Award, which aims to acknowledge independent voices offering an alternative to the mainstream media. You can vote for us by going to freespeechcoalition.info slash media award. And thank you to all, all of those who voted to get us to this stage. The winner will be announced at the Liberty Fest Gala Dinner next Saturday night, which we will be attending. You can still grab your tickets for the Liberty Fest Conference in Brisbane which goes from the 28th to the 29th of September by going to libertyfest.org.au. There are a couple of public rallies coming up which our followers may be interested in attending. There is the International Freedom of Speech Day which is being held on Saturday, October 6th at 12pm at Wiley Park in Lakemba in Sydney. You'll remember that Lakemba was the suburb where Lauren Southern was told by New South Wales Police to move along when she approached the local mosque. So it has been chosen as the location where Australian free speech needs the most defending it is being organized by the true blue crew new south wales and by patriot lawyer john bolton in melbourne there is the annual march for the babies being held at treasury gardens on saturday the 13th of october at 1 p.m it is held every year during this time as it is the anniversary of the 2008 passing of victoria's abortion law reform bill which legalized abortion in the state until birth it is held to remember the babies killed and to advocate for the law to be changed to protect the unborn Next up on the touring schedule is internet television personality and founder of the Proud Boys, Gavin McGuinness. He is being hosted by Penthouse Australia and you can book your place uh, by going to gavinlive.com.au. Also, as always, please consider becoming a patron of The Unshackled by going to patreon.com slash The Unshackled. Or like many of you are doing, please send us a direct contribution via our PayPal link, which is paypal.me slash The Unshackled, which we are very grateful for. It all helps us continue to expand and uh, produce our output here at The Unshackled. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.